All right, once again, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining the call. We'll um, take a moment to pray, and uh, then we'll get started. Uh, if Pastor Jekumar joins, I will ask him to uh, lead this session. Uh, but let's just wait and see. Okay, let's pray, and then we'll... Uh, We'll get started. Afni, would you like to lead us in prayer, please? We'll start. Sure, Pastor. Thank you. Heavenly and gracious Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for your awesome presence. We thank you for the promises that we stand upon. We thank you for this time of great fellowship, Father, when we are learning deep secrets, Father. We are learning about your truth, Father the way you pour out your wisdom and love over us, Father, and the way you teach us, Lord Father, we are overwhelmed, we are thankful. From the bottom of our hearts, we thank you for each of these, uh, Lord Father, people who are joining in, Father, in your grace and mercy. We ask you to anoint our teachers. We ask you to fill us with your wisdom, to have ears to listen, Father, to understand what you want us to speak to us, Father, this morning. And Lord Father, be rooted in your truth, Father, so that we can be true stewards of your kingdom, Father, and we can serve you in spirit and in truth, Father. As you are preparing us, we ask you to take complete control of the next uh, few hours, Father, when we would be learning about your word, we would be prepared uh, for uh, becoming your kingdom uh, citizens, citizens, Father. And in every step, we want your intervention, Father. Continue to lead us, watch over us, help us, guide us, and fill us. We ask this prayer in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. 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 All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. And um, yeah, so this is our mentoring hour. We just keep it as an open time for question, answers, discussion, uh, things that we would like to uh, have addressed from the Word of God. So um, uh, feel free to um, go ahead and share your questions in the uh, chat, and uh, or you could unmute your mic and ask your questions or bring up a topic for discussion. And uh, yeah, maybe uh, Nancy, would you want to host today, or would you like to host today? Uh, yes, Pastor, sure. I'll do that. Thank you. Okay, I was thinking I'll ask Pastor Jake, come on, but I don't see him here. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, no, okay no. Pastor Jake. Okay, anyway, let's see. Go ahead. Maybe next yes. week I'll ask Pastor Jake Kumar. Today, oh, okay. you go and host it, and yes, uh, we'll all be here. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, please. Pastor. Yes, thank uh, you. Sure, um, sure. Sorry, I just heard my name being mentioned. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so no, we were, uh, I was thinking of asking you to host it. Oh, I see. But, okay, but okay. before you joined, I asked Nancy. <laughs> right, right, right. So then I said, okay, I'll ask Pastor Dix to do it next week. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. sure. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, go ahead, Nancy. There's already a question on the chat. Yes, um, yes, Pastor. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning uh, once again, and welcome, everyone. So, um, uh, we have one question on the chat here from Kiran. It's from Hebrews 12, verses 22 to 24. Uh, I'm just trying to get that verse. Okay, uh, she is asking for an explanation um, uh, about that verse. So the scripture here is, just a moment, please. Right, so um, yes, I've posted the um, verses here. That ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So um, 
uh, Kiran, uh, you want an explanation for this? And uh, uh, more specifically, you want to know, uh, is, the, is the second question on the chat connected to the first one, Kiran? Yes, ma'am. OK, OK. So that's what you want to know from uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Yes. OK. So Kiran is asking, uh, what about all those pastors and believers who are dying in today's time? OK. All right. OK. Um, yes, I think uh, Kiran here uh, has also considered that verse at the end, which says, uh, the blood of sprinkling, let's speak it better things than that of Abel. And today we have a lot of pastors and believers uh, who are dying. And uh, um, uh, Kiran, uh, for the sake of the gospel, is, is that like, for being persecuted for that yes. reason? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, fine. So she's asking, um, uh, how does that work like when pastors and believers die for the sake of the gospel? Would anyone want to uh, take this up and address her question? Okay. Um, uh, so Karen, I'm, I'm not sure whether you, um, you you want an explanation of the whole passage or just about the blood, but let's just see. Uh, let's just give a quick summary of what uh, the writer of Hebrews is doing here. Uh, in, in chapter 12, you know, uh, if you see the whole train of thought, uh, he's finished in chapter 11 about the he heroes of faith. Then he turns his attention to us, teaching us how we run our journey of faith, you know, run with endurance, looking to Jesus. Then he talks about uh, 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 God disciplining us as children. So that's, again, another thought uh, that he's covering in Hebrews 12. And then he comes to doing a lot of contrast, right? So that means uh, he picks up things from the Old Testament and says, don't be like that. Don't be like that. So you can see, you know, if you, uh, uh, verse 16, he says, don't be like Esau, right? Um, and then, uh, so he, he, he does that contrast. And then when he comes to verse 18, so between 18 and 22, again, there's another contrast. So in 18, he says, verse 18, Hebrews 12, 18, no, you have not come to the mountain. That means in the Old Testament, right? The people came to the Mount Sinai where you know, there was, they encountered God, but it was in a very fearsome, awesome way. People could not even touch the mountain. Even if an animal came on the mountain, the animal was killed, right? So he says, that's not how we have come to God. Instead, we're then he says, verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion. So there's a contrast here. Uh, in the Old Testament, people under the law, uh, they couldn't come, they couldn't even approach God. They couldn't even come near the mountain. New Testament, this is a Mount Zion. It's not talking about a physical mountain. It's talking about the heavenly Jerusalem, the, the Mount Zion in, in the spiritual realm, right? So everything in verse 22 to 24 on is spiritual. 18 to 21 is the natural, under the law, with Moses. 22 to 24 is, um, is spiritual. It is, it is real, but is spiritual, right? So he talks about, you know, what, where we have come. We've come to the New Jerusalem. We've, uh, you know, come into the assembly, the church of the firstborn and so on. So all this deals with the spiritual. That's where we are. That's how we have come to God. That's what we belong to. That's how we approach God. It's all of that. And in that context, verse 24, he talks about uh, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, right? The blood of sprinkling. So the covenant that Jesus has entered, uh, brought us into is a new covenant. That new covenant has been ratified or brought into effect by the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus is much more, it speaks better things than that of Abel's. Okay, that means Abel was murdered, his blood cried out for justice, but Jesus, his blood was shed, it established the new covenant, and his blood is announcing a lot, 
better things, right? It's telling us that we've been justified, we're reconciled with God, the work is completed, redemption is completed, so on. So that's the contrast. So Abel's blood was crying out for mercy. The blood of Jesus announces mercy has been given, right? That's the contrast. Now, can we and should we apply this to martyrs, you know, people who are being killed today for the gospel? In one sense, yes, right? Uh, uh, the Bible tells us in, in Psalms, precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. So if wherever people are being martyred, God is noticing. And in one sense, like the blood of Abel, there's a cry going out to God for that. So if that was your question, the answer is yes. Yeah, God is noticing it. and There's a cry going out to God uh, for that. Hope that helps, Kurt. Okay, Nancy, you can take over. Yes, Pastor, thank you. So, uh, Kiran, um, is that all right? You have anything more to ask in this regard? Okay, sure. So, uh, Kiran is fine with that. Uh, thank you, Pastor, for answering her question. So, we have another question here from Zeli Tony, and uh, she asks, um, what's the what is the church's take on COVID vaccination because the points of view are divided among the believers here in Nagaland. Some are saying it's the mark of the beast and so on. And most common people are living in fear. So uh, yes, about the COVID vaccination and how we look at that you know, from the biblical perspective. Um, oh. Yes. Uh, would someone like to share your thoughts? Anyone from the faculty? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sure all of us uh, will agree on this, but um, yeah, so literally, uh, our position is that, uh, you know, the COVID vaccine is just a vaccine. And uh, uh, there's, you know, see, what's happened is uh, there's been so many, you know, we call it conspiracy theories or misinformation that's that's flooding every day. People are putting out all kinds of things because of the internet and uh, you know free access to technology and social media. So people are just putting out random stuff. Uh, some people and a lot of people are doing it intentionally. You know, uh, whatever their motivation may be. Uh, they belong to different groups that are, you know, are they have fun spreading misinformation, creating conspiracy theories and all of that. And so in the last, you know, so year and a half or so, there have been so many nonsensical things being put out on the internet about vaccines, about all, all of this, right? And sadly, a lot of people have bought into it, uh, including people in the church. Uh, uh, and uh, if you look at it, it's just vaccine is just to help the body fight against this particular, in this case, this virus. And uh, in India, you know, babies are all vaccinated for different things. You know, they, it's, a, it's just a normal thing. I mean, not just in India, but in many parts of the world. Uh, it's just to boost the immunity to help. And it's just taking science or knowledge and using it for our benefit. That's all it is. And God wants us to do that, right? He's given us minds. He's helped us. He helps us understand his creation. And uh, today, the world is not the way God originally designed it. You know, there's all kinds of sicknesses and diseases, and all kinds of things around us. And, uh, and so God just wants us to use the knowledge we have to fight against sickness and disease. I mean, think about the apostle, great apostle Paul. Uh, he writes to Timothy and says, Timothy, I want you to drink a little wine for your stomach's sake because you have common stomach problems, infirmities. Now, most people will use that as an excuse to drink wine, but that's not the reason why Paul wrote it. He's just using some common information. He says, use wine as a medicine, as a, for a medicinal, its medicinal value to, to, he's telling Timothy, now both are men of God, both are apostles of God. So one apostle is telling another apostle, hey, 
use a little wine for your stomach's sake. You've got a lot of frequent stomach problems. What is he saying? He's saying take something that will enhance your body's ability to overcome uh, uh, whatever his problem was. Do they believe in the power of God? Of course. This, is Paul, Paul an anointed apostle? Of course. Did he work signs, wonders, and miracles? Of course. But there's also the simple use your common sense, use your knowledge uh, to you know stay healthy so you can serve God. And that's all this this vaccine is. Uh, you know, today's you know we've learned a lot more. So we have have advantage of scientific knowledge, and we're just making use of it for our health and so on. So our response is go ahead. You know, Jesus made an interesting statement, which I think sometimes it's a very strong statement, but it, it kind of speaks about the, the, ch the church today. He says, Jesus said this, he said, you know, uh, the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. In other words, you know, if you, if you paraphrase it, he's saying the people of this world are smarter than God's people. You know, and when you look at God's people fighting about, should I wear a mask? Should I not wear a mask? Should I wear to get vaccine? Vaccine? You know, it's like, hey, Jesus already spoke about you. You know, the children of this world are smarter than the children of light. Now that's a very sad thing, and that's not the way it's supposed to be. But unfortunately, this is what's happening, right? So our answer to this, and I'll keep it short, we can talk more on this, but our answer, is, my answer to it is, you know, use the knowledge God has given to us to protect ourselves, to take care of our health, uh, all with the intent to, you know, live well and serve God, you know. So uh, the, uh, the vaccine being a mark of the beast is an untrue statement, is a misinformation, and uh, we'll do well to avoid it. Okay, I'll stop here, and, but then hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Pastor. Um, and uh, Zilitoli, does it uh, does it answer your question? Okay, great. So thank you, Zilitoli. Um, we have. We have. Uh, uh, Please, I want to ask a follow up someone. question on the on the vaccination. Just a short one. Uh, Abraham, uh, Abraham, you have a question. You have a question. Yes, like a, a follow-up question on the vaccine issue. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, I now, I mean, Vietnam has been locked down for almost about four, four months now because of the same uh, COVID issue. And uh, I happened to um, live with a friend that just came to visit me just for um, assistance. Then here is the case that he, he went for the vaccine and yet that same person has been affected with the same COVID. Now he has been taken to the quarantine for almost about 14 days now. So looking at the subject of vaccination, um, with my understanding, a vaccine is supposed to help prevent someone from actually getting the sickness. But these people are vaccinated and this is not a story. This is an example that I have on my table right now. That this person is vaccinated, but yet this person has the COVID and then they are asking for a second job and all those things. So, but with my understanding, those who are taking vaccine, at least it should be one time for a very long time. But this one is like something that is, um, is done every month or at least you need to take two, three before you can um, actually be, be okay or actually be, be able to fight this sickness. So looking at that understanding and the way vaccines are supposed to work, I, I will have a question to to ask in a way that it are those things really vaccines or are these things are just things that are, are medicine what is the main idea of this vaccine are they medicine or they are vaccines because vaccines at least okay. must be administered okay. once and not twice and then not three or four times just to make sure your immune system is fighting against the disease that we don't even know the origin you know okay. up to okay. now the science the scientists because i happen to be in the med medical field also Okay. So, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, up to now, they don't know where that thing came from, and okay. they don't know okay. where it came from. How can we get the right vaccine in order to make sure that we are curing this disease? So, these are the questions that I would like to ask as someone in yes. the medical yes. field who is also trying to add the scriptures and also this this medical aspect. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank and you. that's your voices echoing at it. Yes, uh, Pastor. I think that's because Abraham has me on. 
like he's probably not wearing headphones so from his side uh, uh, okay so um uh, uh, abraham's question is um about the uh, the you know like the dosage frequency uh, of uh, this particular vaccine and he's saying um, like if it's if um, it, it were to be you know once in a long uh, uh, term then that's easier but this vaccine has uh, booster doses um, and uh, you know basically he's he's saying that uh, it it needs to be more effective in the way it is administered and also he talked about an example of his friend who um, uh, contracted the covid uh, infection so uh, what i want to say about this is see abraham it's like any other uh, scientific um, you know scientific uh, uh, progress uh, with regard to any other medicine or, or vaccine now if you particularly look at vaccines uh, you know they they have been developed uh, based on you know different techniques and then it's taken years for several vaccines to to come to the place where they are right now and it is true that uh, you know some vaccines need to be administered quite often like even if you take uh, the flu vaccine which is i think generally it's not given out here in india but uh, other countries like the us and all uh, they do it often they they even do it like you know uh, every year so uh, depending on the on the science of that uh, vaccine uh, you may have to take it uh, you know more often but uh, the point is see uh, as pastor mentioned this is this is for our benefit this is to boost our immunity and this is to protect us against the, the uh, current pandemic so overall the bottom line is that it's a good thing it's a good thing to protect uh, our body because we know that this body is the is the temple of god you know um so uh, with that in mind uh, i think yes i know that we we may not have the perfect solution yet or, or you know how soon are we going to have the perfect solution i don't know because there are uh, all the efforts scientific efforts that are going on but whatever is available and whatever is good i think we can just go ahead and take that uh, and coming to the question of uh, you know someone contracting covid i know we are digressing uh, over here this is more like a scientific uh, discussion but what i want to say is even if you look up the numbers of uh, uh, you know the proportion of people who are adversely affected by the vaccine you would notice that proportion is very small compared to those who are actually benefiting from it and this happens in in uh, the case of other medicines also uh, in, and uh, you know so many other things so i think we shouldn't we shouldn't let a few uh, adverse um reports here and there stop us from uh make, taking advantage of the benefits of the vaccine so uh, just some thoughts there uh, ibrahim uh, and I, i hope that helps and if someone else someone wants, else to, wants add, to add yeah yeah okay so uh, yeah. is that okay is that okay yeah thank you so much what thank you Yes, thank you so much uh, uh we have john paul uh, here with the question uh, so john says ephesians 2 1 uh, and 5 we read we were dead in trespasses how is this different from dead to sin as we see in romans 6 uh pastor dix would you like to i i'm not really sure about the difference because I, i i know that um like there are two different words that are used like um like trespass and sin but both are referring to um the same thing missing the mark uh either willfully or intentionally so um um just that um yeah let me just read ephesians 2 yeah um yeah john you want to yeah but my question was um how is that in sin different from that to sin okay okay um so ephesians 2 verse 1 um so talks about how we were dead in trespasses and sins and also verse 5 that we were de- dead in trespasses and sins and uh, i'm just reading the verses um romans 6 um and uh, okay roman 6 and verse 2 says how shall we who died to sin um is there a difference um 
Oh, well, I I don't really think there is a difference. The fact that we were, you know, dead, um, uh, dead, alive to sin, and actually dead to you know, the things of God. Um, yeah, and think, our, uh, yeah. So I think, yeah, yeah. So one dead in see Ephesians two one and two is talking about our state before coming to Christ, and we are dead in sin. That means we are fully given. We are. We are spiritually dead and we are in sin. That means we are sinning. We are full of sin. If Romans 6 talks about our life in Christ, we are out of sin, but we're dead to it. That means we have no more connection with it. So being dead in sin is talking about our unsaved state and we are fully immersed in it. That means we're given to it. We, you know, we are in it. To sin, dead to sin, Romans 6 is about our state as believers, and we have no connection. We are dead to it. You know, that means I have nothing to do with this. Like a dead man, he's not going to sin. Uh, so he's dead to sin. So the uh, difference is very clear, both in terms of where we are spiritually and what is our relationship with sin. Right, right, Pastor. Thank you. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Tekuma. Thank you, uh, Pastor Ashish. And uh, John, uh, I hope that answers your question. Yes, Pastor. Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so we have uh, more questions here uh, in the chat. Uh, Divya asks, I came across this term called the doctrine of limited atonement, which says that the death of Christ was sufficient to atone for the sins of the whole world, but it was God's will that it should effectively redeem those and only those who were chosen from eternity and given to Christ by the Father based on scriptures like John 6.44 and such. Is it the right biblical perspective? Okay, so Divya is asking if um, uh, this doctrine, uh, which, uh, which, which is about limited atonement, um, is correct. Um, you know, when, when we, um, according to what, what she has written here, it seems like more like, a, you know, there are some who are chosen by the Father could, who can only um, receive the redemption from Christ's work. So is this the right biblical perspective? Yeah. Would uh, anyone like to take this up? Okay, um, Divya, so uh, the answer to that is it's not right, it's wrong. Uh, simple reason is the cross is for everybody, right? So if you go to the very words of Jesus in John 3, 16, very simple, for God so loved the world. He didn't say God loved the ones he had chosen before, no. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever, so you just look at the New Testament, the words, whoever, all, everyone. The cross is for everyone. The cross is for all. The cross for everyone who believes, right? So uh, so this really is a, a, a difference in understanding about what predestination is about. So this idea, the doctrine of limited atonement, is an extrapolation of the idea of predestination and it's a misapplication of it. So they're basically saying, you know, the Bible does say that there are those who have been predestined, but we explain predestination as not as God's predetermination, but of people to be saved, but as God's predetermination of his plan of what will happen to those who are saved. Right? So the gospel is for everybody. The cross is for everybody. The people who respond, everybody's invited. The people, and this you can clearly see even in the story, in the parable that Jesus gave about the kingdom, where you know a rich man, uh, you know, had a wedding feast, and he tells the servants to go call everybody, you know, call on the highways and byways. So, and he says, all, you know, many are invited. Everybody, the invitation is open, but the ones who respond, they are the ones who become the chosen ones. So many are called, few are chosen. Who are the chosen? The ones who respond to the call. But the call goes out to everybody. Now, God, in his foreknowledge, knows who will respond and say yes. God knows ahead of time 
who are the chosen ones. He doesn't decide their choice. He just knows their choice, right? And and uh, then he has a plan for those who will, will respond, which is to be conformed to the image of his son. That's Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 29 and 30. So this doctrine of limited atonement is a misapplication of that. You know, so what they are saying is, hey, because there are people who are called the chosen ones, therefore what God did on the cross, what Christ did on the cross is limited to only those chosen ones. That is not true at all. Because throughout the gospels and the epistles, the invitation is for whosoever will call on the name of the Lord. It is for everyone, you know. So the gospel is an open invitation for everyone. And those who respond are the chosen ones, not because God decided their choice, but God knew their choice. Okay, so that's how we should understand it. Hope that it uh, helps. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor. I was really troubled to, you know, um, hear about this. Uh, but yeah, it makes it very clear. And uh, which was the reference you spoke about in Romans? Uh, yeah, it's like Romans 8. 29 and 30. It's a, one of those key verses in, about predestination. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you, Pastor. And uh, thank you, Vivya, for that question. Uh, we'll move on to Abhishek's question here uh, in the chat section. So Abhishek has uh, shared two verses. Mm. Okay. So uh, Matthew 23, verse 9, he says, Jesus said, do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Uh, and then verse 10, and uh, do not be called teacher, for one is your teacher, the Christ. Uh, and uh, based on these verses, Abhishek asks, uh, Pastor, can you explain these two verses? And then uh, second question, Jesus said regarding the modern church culture about spiritual father and spiritual mother. Uh, third question is, uh, today we see a rise in spiritual father and mother in the church. Is it biblical or just they want to control or dominate the believers? So uh, we can take this up in two parts, Abhishek. Uh, maybe first we can explain uh, these verses. And then uh, I think your second and third question are kind of tied together. You're asking about this uh, you know, I don't know if it's a new culture, but the culture of uh, spiritual fathers and mothers in the church uh, and whether uh, this is biblical or it, it is something that uh, you know, leaders use to uh, control and dominate believers. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the verses here, uh, I just like to share some thoughts and then, uh, you know, the others could also please share your views. Um, although it says, uh, you know, Jesus said that do not call anyone on earth your father. Now, obviously, we know that, uh, you know, he he's not forbidding us from addressing um, a father as a father. Okay, because we, we have other scriptures in uh, the Bible that say you honor your father and mother, uh, you know, uh, so if we are honoring them then obviously we we know that you know god has put them in a certain position in our lives and then we have um, as a part of our honor uh, the the due respect that we have for them and all that you know comes into play so uh, uh, while interpreting uh, statements like this we shouldn't you know take it as a one off thing uh, like we say right you let the scripture interpret scripture so other, there are other scriptures that talk about um, honoring fathers, honoring mothers. So uh, Jesus was not saying that you should not call anybody father, but he was saying that we must uh, we must know that our heavenly father is the greatest and give him uh, that priority uh, above everyone else. And similarly, you know, it applies even to teacher uh, where we, we consider, you know, God as our greatest teacher. Uh, and um, uh, coming to the second part here, uh, uh, the thing about spiritual fathers and mothers. Well, uh, in the Bible, we do see um, that we, we see, you know, mature believers nurturing and uh, guiding and leading uh, younger believers. A good example would be that of Paul, who mentored Timothy, he mentored, you know, Titus, so many other people. So um, uh, even though, like, you know, you, you don't um, have lots of scriptures where, where, uh, Timothy is addressing Paul as father and all that. 
we do know that this kind of a relationship a positive relationship did exist uh, in the bible and so uh, yeah so this 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 culture uh, there's nothing wrong with it but then uh, i do understand the uh, part where you're saying you know when when uh, uh, people are people uh, have have to call someone father or you know spiritual mother and then there is a relationship created there uh, through which the leaders uh, you know dictate terms uh, they 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 control the decision of the believers now obviously we know that you know something like that it's not biblical it's not born out of love uh, and so uh, uh, having that kind of a relationship uh, is not biblical and it is it is wrong Okay, so uh, just some thoughts that uh, I uh, I wanted to share, and uh, maybe the others could also please add to this. Yeah, um, I think what Nancy said is uh, is correct, and you know, so basically there is a lot of misapplication of this whole idea of spiritual fathers and mothers in the church today, uh, which is uh, just another form of control. Uh, and uh, and we've done a sermon series. I'm just going to share the link here. Uh, we addressed this whole thing a couple of years back. And so if you're interested, uh, we, we broke it as a three-part sermon series. We addressed, you know, this whole and, and, and a lot of it is part of this prophetic movement you're seeing today where, you know, people ask who is your Moses or who is your Paul or whatever, you know, and a lot of that. But actually, problems in the church happen in cycles, just like, you know, fashion trends keep going. They go out of trend and they come back and this thing. So what we're seeing today was actually something that happened back in the 80s. In the 80s, there was a shepherding movement and it was just a, you know, regurgitation of the same truth. Now it's coming back now about, you know, 40 years later in the form of this prophetic fathers, mothers. So uh, it's kind of like this whole thing, these problems keep you know, surfacing, then it goes away and then it keeps surfacing over and over again. Uh, that, but as Nancy said, uh, there is a right application to it. And when, when God genuinely places leaders, you know, people to nurture you, wonderful. But uh, you don't have to, you know, go around calling people as your spiritual father and mother. There's no, there's no need to do that. You quietly receive through their lives and serve God. Ultimately, we all have to serve the Lord. And uh, we don't have to go around calling so-and-so as my spiritual son and so as my spiritual daughter. There's no need to do that. You know, just, just be normal, you know. Uh, if somebody is receiving from your life, thank God for it. Uh, just, just, you know, all of us are submitted to Christ. That's all, you know. Now, we know Paul referred to Timothy. Uh, that was his expression of affection for Timothy, my beloved son. He called him. Uh, that's okay, but we don't have to go around calling everybody my beloved son, my beloved daughter, and make a big deal of it. I think that's you know just out of place in the church today. It's become a big deal, uh, and we shouldn't fall into the same uh, mistakes. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Abhishek, I, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Abhishek. Yes. Uh, so Zilitoli has uh, another question here for us. She says, "What's uh, what's the right approach to give a good defense uh, with someone who's inclined to New Age teachings on inner healing, digging to the past for healing and deliverance?" So uh, Zalitoli, um, I just want to understand your question here. So you're, you're saying that there are people who use new age techniques for inner healing. Uh, is that right or wrong? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And are you uh, asking more specifically, like, should believers use these teachings or you're saying in general, you know, a lot of people are using this, believers and unbelievers? Uh, Nancy, she's believe. talking specifically about looking into the past. For healing and deliverance, if you Thank look you, at Pastor. her, look at her question. She's talking yes. about, like, should we go into the past to bring healing? Mm -hmm. I think that's the okay. specific thing. Okay, Pastor. Okay, okay, sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Zilatuli. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, so, yes, uh, is it all right to dig deep into the past for inner healing? That's Zilatuli's question. So, uh, should we do that as believers? Uh, would um, Jean, if Jean is on the call, I think. Uh... 
Yeah, I'll try and make yes. an attempt. Um, so yes. um, from what I understand of New Age uh, religion, um, uh, it, it is not specifically about uh, digging into the past that is termed as New Age. Um, New Age beliefs are generally about, um, you know, that God is in everything, um, all things, you know, uh, are one, uh, you know, those concepts of uh, monoism, pantheism, uh, you know, a man is God, that uh, uh, one's own experience really validates, uh, you know, the, uh, what what God does. So I, that's what I understand is New Age. But um, according to what Zilutoli is asked, she specifically asked if digging into the past uh, is required for inner healing. So, um, so uh, you know, just, just through a counseling profession, I think I'd, I'd want to speak through that, is that there are many circumstances, life experiences, um, emotional hurts that we may go through in our life that does impact the way we think, the way we behave, uh, and the way we feel. And um, uh, so, so a lot of these instances or conditions that we may go through does uh, affect our person, does affect our relationships, and even to an extent of the way that we see God. So when we look at inner healing or when we're looking at emotional wholeness, um, it, although you don't dwell into the past, uh, but it, I think it is, a, it's, it's a practice or, or it's helpful to understand what could be some of the roots or the sources of these hurts and these uh, difficulties, so that um, you know you become aware and understand uh, what are some of the patterns or habits or lifestyle um, changes that that you've made as a result of those um, uh, those past thoughts or past incidents. So looking back. Uh, so digging back into the past really helps us become aware. But as a believer, we are called to put off the old and put on the new. So, uh, you know, so whatever has been of the sinful nature, whatever has been of our past is to be kept aside and uh, uh, taken and the, the identity of Christ is taken on. So even in emotional healing, you, you need to come to a place of awareness of where you are and what really draws you into sin or draws you into uh, emotional, um, you know, wrong patterns so that you can begin to um, meditate on God's word specifically and deal with, with some, of, some of those conditions. I'll, I'll just give maybe a very quick example. Uh, for example, let's say a person who's abused, um, you know, as a child. So there can be very many thoughts or um, understanding about who they are that impacts their living, their, their current conditions. But um, being a believer and knowing who Christ is, you with the word, you renew your mind so that you do not go back to the past forms, you know, the work of the, of the flesh or the work of the mind that, that really pulls you back to a place of sin or a place of uh, being away from God. But as a believer, you would use some of those um, things that you have found from your past so that it doesn't get repeated again and you have your new new way of uh, instructing yourself in God's word, meditating yourself in God's word so that, you know, those behaviors or those thoughts are, are renewed, you know, capturing all of that, captivating all of that in obedience to Christ so that uh, we live more renewed lives. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And uh, Silitoli, I, I hope that uh, answered your question. Yes, ma'am. That was very helpful. Uh, why I asked the question was, you know, like in the past, um, uh, we used to minister together with other uh, partner with other ministers and work together. And while they are ministering, you know, like the ministers, they used to be in the past in, you know, they do all those things. So I want to be very clear. So in the future, when I minister to people, uh, it will be more effective. That was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Can I just add a add a quick? Yes, question? yes, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so totally just to clarify, right? So the I mean, what we say is there is no need to dig up the past. Uh, you know, 
to whatever extent, okay, you know, to some, like if somebody can wants to go back and, you know, uh, address her specific things, okay, to that extent, yes, but not the way that inner healing is being done in the church today, right? So there are, like you're mentioning, there are many ministries that do inner healing, but what they do is they make you sit down and they make you recall, you know, sit and talk about what has happened 15, 25 years ago and things like that. That is very unhealthy and we should not do that. I think to answer your question, in all forms of healing, whether it's physical healing, inner healing, follow Jesus. That's the answer. Jesus never, when he ministered to people, he never said, okay, what did your grandfather do? Or, you know, what happened 20 years ago? You never find Jesus interviewing anybody that way. You know, uh, and so our answer is, hey, just follow Jesus. Minister the way Jesus ministered. He never interviewed people and took them through this process. There were some instances, like Jean pointed out, said, okay, yes, there are situations where you need to handle. And the way Peter restored Jesus, uh, the way Jesus restored Peter, right? Uh, it, it, you know, uh, it's it a beautiful one in John 20, you know, he, he just said, you know, he knew what Peter was struggling with, but you see him, he doesn't go back and dig up the past, you know, uh, hey, Peter, you know, uh, uh, seven days ago, you denied me three times or 15 days ago. He doesn't do that. He goes forward from where he has, takes him forward. So a short answer to your questions, literally, in every case of ministry, just follow Jesus. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for uh, adding that point. Uh, oh, we have uh, one question here in the chat, and I think we have time, sufficient time just to answer this one question. So we will take this up uh, before we wrap up today. So uh, Herbert asks, I have a church I pray from at my place of work and my church in my motherland in the village, but I would prefer to send my tithe to my motherland church. Is there any problem? Thank you. So, um, yes, would, would someone like to take up this question on uh, type, giving type? Um, well, um, I'll just uh, answer yes. that, respond to that. Well, uh, tithes um, are, are, are um, the way the Lord instituted it is, um, uh, you know, uh, to the place where, uh, like in today's time, to the to the church where you are, where you are, one is part of, and where one is spiritually fed, and uh, where one is connected, in order to receive and to give, right? In order to serve, uh, where one is spiritually connected. So, um, if uh, whichever church that you are connected in that manner. Right, where you are fed spiritually, where you are fellowshipping, where you are serving and receiving, um, you know, that would be the best place to give uh, the tithes. Yeah. Yes. yes, thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Um, Herbert, uh, does that answer your question? Yes, please, Madam Nancy. Okay, all right. Yes. Uh, would, would anyone else want to add to this? of tithes okay and i think uh, herbert's question is answered uh, as well so uh, what we can do now we just have a minute left so i would like to request uh, someone to please uh, lead us uh, in prayer uh, and then we wrap up today's session uh, is anyone abhishek would you like to lead us please in a word of prayer okay ma'am Thank you. Heavenly Father, we come before your presence right in the name of Lord Jesus. Whatever we learned from today's session in mentoring class, bless all the faculty teachers and bless all the APC students in online and e-learning sessions. And, and, and I ask you, Lord, to give us, each one of us, a passion and desire for you more and hunger after you, Lord and bless this bible college and use use our teacher more for your kingdom and bless them abundantly thank you for this session thank you for for mentoring us thank you for guiding us lord by these uh, teachers bless this bible college in jesus name we pray amen 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Abhishek, for leading us uh, in prayer today. And uh, yeah, so I, I know we all have uh, classes to get to. So have a wonderful time of learning. Uh, God bless all of you. And we will connect again uh, on this mentoring session next Thursday. Yes. Uh, thank you. God bless you, everyone. And uh, see you again.